Thank you for having me here. Uh, I, I find this a, you know, a lot of fun. I like getting ready for demos because I find I learn so much because I over rehearse. I spend a lot of time, and, and, and as a result, I'm always looking for the fastest or the best or or an alternative way, and, and so I get a lot out of it. So I appreciate the opportunity to, to do this. I consider myself a wood turner. I'm not a wood artist. I turn in a in a shop. I don't turn in a studio and. And the kind of stuff I'm showing you tonight is pretty typical of a lot of the stuff that I make, and it's pretty basic stuff. I've been a member here for right at eight years. Uh, I look around the room and I see, you know, Jane has been here uh, about as long as I have, and and Jerry, and other than that, I don't remember too, too many of the rest of y'all out there in, uh, back when we used to meet in Ted Rick's shop. So I feel like I've come a long way since then. First project, I'm gonna do three projects tonight, uh, time permitting, we're gonna do lamp pulls uh, or fan pulls. We're going to do a pill box or a needle case or, or a, uh, a toothpick uh, holder, depending on how you wanna make it. And then the third one, we're gonna uh, do at least one, one knob. So we're gonna start off with, you know, why would you wanna make lamp pulls? Well, you know, because you can, they're fun, but also, but you look at the lamp poles that come with a typical lamp or fan, and they're just kind of butt ugly. I mean, you know, they're nothing, they're just not real pretty. And it's so nice to have something that, that you know, you can get fancy and make acorns. Um, I've got uh, some of them I'll pass around. Here's a... The approach that I'm going to use, you take a block of wood, all about maybe an inch or so, could be a large fat pen blank, somewhere around two and a half inches long. I think in my article I said three inches, that's probably a little long, uh, but it can work. Uh, this one tip I want to show you, take a magnetic, uh, take a rare earth magnet and tape it to your pencil. and and it's easy to, uh, to find. Somebody said, you know, use uh, CA glue. I tried that, it doesn't work. Sooner or later it's gonna fail. Uh, I've yet to have one fail with the, with the tape. It also works real well with a chuck for a drill press. Yeah, I've got one on, on my, my chuck. First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna drill a hole in this thing. saw one guy that put replaced the eraser with the rear magnet. The pencil stuck straight up. I'm thinking, man, if I slipped or something, you know, through the hand, through. Not a good idea. No. Let's, let's see if we can't get this in a little bit better. This is a, uh, I use Nova Chucks, not because they're the best, it's because of what I got started with. Um, and I recently got these Sorby 35 millimeter jaws, which I really like because, as I was telling one of the members here, they're just very versatile. Nova does not have a chuck uh, size that, with an internal tenon that'll grip like this, this does. And I don't know what the patent arrangement is, but for whatever reason, Sorby's chuck jaws are an exact match to the same specs as the Nova. So first thing I do is do a little bit of a starter hole. So when I do drill that hole, it'll find its way. We're gonna use two drills. Uh, one is a 960 force. Now you can put this in a, force, uh, in a drill chuck in your tailstock, but, but what's the point? You can hold it in a set of vice grips, but again, what's the point? It's, you know, if you're gonna do this a few times, grab you an extra one and, and uh, stick it on there. And you don't have to do anything really fancy once you got that hole drilled, just, you know, stick it in. 
Something tells me somebody has this on reverse. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, I passed, right? You ever have your portable drill in reverse and not realize it until you got the drill? <laughs> now, when you reverse this thing, this thing has is not finely milled stock that's gone through a plane or a joint or anything. Just reverse it exactly 180 degrees so you'll uh, maintain pretty much the same orientation and then you're a little more likely to have those holes uh, match. You said that drill was 964? Yes, just a shade over an eighth of an inch and the reason is because of the chain that you're going to be using. Oh, okay, I see. Uh, one eighth inch hole won't, won't accommodate that, uh, that chain. Yeah. Now it'll accommodate a cord if you're going to use a cord on it. So we're going to do the same thing on, on the back side. We'll just do a little bit of a starter hole. Would this be better done with a, a jig for drilling the, uh, holes for pen blanks? Guess you could, you, you could make, you know, you can make it more complicated than it really is. Now I won't say that, I won't say that that's more complicated, but this is just so easy I just can't think of any way you can... I was can... saying the other way because I happen to have that jig on my drill press and it's just sitting there. Um, I've done the drill press thing and it, and it works. You put it on the drill. Uh, well, actually, actually, I'm looking for a scraper. That's the problem when you carry too many tools. You're not careful. Yeah, this is a tool I made out of a piece of a high-speed steel, three-eighths inch stock, and since I just need a little scraper, this will this will work. This is the few opportunities you can see it a little bit later why this is important, but you want to kind of face this off because this is your only opportunity to finish the bottom of the this uh, this lamp pull. So this one is 5 sixteenths, just a shade over a quarter of an inch. Why? You've got to have a little bigger hole to hold the ball on the end of the chain. And uh, you know, there's nothing magic about this size. This size, I find, works well for me. Now how deep you go? Uh, in my article, I think I said somewhere around 3 eighths or a half inch. Since then, I've modified that a little bit. When it comes to buying chain, you can, you can get a Walmart. You can get it at Home Depot. You can get it three foot lengths. Uh, your best buy, if you can do a bunch of these, might be little four inch lengths from Craft Supply because they're like 50 cents a piece, and they've got the ball and they got the coupler on it. And it's those odd, those extra pieces that get expensive, not just buying the chain. Uh, if you get a four inch piece, if you don't drill this hole a little bit deeper, you got an awful lot of chain down here, and you only have just a little bit sticking out. So it kind of depends on your chain uh, source which route you go. So now we're going to take this out and mount it between the centers. Now there's lots of ways you can mount these tween centers, but I tell you this little, a uh, turn a little mandrel, Bob Black showed you how to do this. It just fits some Morse taper. This tends to work fairly well. And you taper it a little bit and you give yourself a lot of room so you can work around the bottom of it. Now on this end, it's nice if you've got some type of cone that can get down in here. Um, what works for me is this, uh, this Nova system. I really like it because it's got a lot of different parts to play with. But it, it gives you some unique capability you don't have with a standard original equipment one like this. It gives you kind of a standoff 
standoff distance that makes it a little easier to turn down to the end. Now, if you like, it's, it's not a bad idea I think I brought one with me. I had it in an article. You can turn a cone out of wood that, that fits over and does well, and that has the uh, positive side of not dulling your tool if you get too close to it. But this, this tends to work just fine, too. Now, we can use a spindle rough and gouge on this since it's just a simple basic spindle project. Rob, how fast do you uh, turn when you make pins? I turn up all the way. Well, this is at 3200. You think of this as a small pin. Very safe when you're turning small things like this to crank up the speed. Just makes it a little easier. Now, when you make these things, I find it a good idea to make them in pairs. Because if you give them away as gifts, you know, generally it's two of them on a lamp. There's a lamp pull and a fan pull, so think about that. Make them a little bit different, but, but complementary or, or, or similar. And in terms of a style, it ought to be fat on one end and skinny on the other. Otherwise, it's just a lumpy piece of wood. Uh, my opinion, you know, for whatever it's worth, and like I say, I'm a turner, not a wood artist. But So we're going to turn this down. Think of it as a as a kind of a funny or special purpose little finial and we're just going to kind of turn it into a triangle before we do anything else with it. Now I'm going to switch to a 3 8 inch spindle gouge. I gotta keep tightening this up because this wood, uh, wood moves. Now, you can make this thing most any kind of design you want. I think the key is having some flow to it. Unsupported cut, that's what you get. A little bit of a cat. We're going to, I'm going to make a little ball at the bottom of this. Got to be careful how I enter the wood. Don't try to take off too much at one time. This is ornamental cherry, which just is, winds up being a real pretty piece of wood. Came out of a neighbor's yard. probably switch tools more than a lot of people. I think there's a lot of advantage to using fewer tools and getting real good at it. But you know, I got a lot of tools, so I use them and tend to find the one that I think is the best tool for that particular use. The reason I'm switching now to a detail gouge is because I can get in a lot tighter than I could with, with that other one where the wings had a tendency to get in there. But because this, this uh, detail gouge has a much shallower flute, it, when you grind it, 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 it's very pointed, which can be real good if you're doing detail, not so good if you're doing shapes. So the regular detail gouge works better unless you're using this as kind of a, a skew where you come along with, with the edge. And a skew would work just as well, if not better, for this, for, the, for this particular cut. 
Now, at this point in time, I'm going to call that pretty much good unless we want to take time to sand it, which I'm not going to do. Um, well, I can see the little uh, Mike, you were saying skate you back I got make, on this. You were saying you make two at a time. You make you make two alike. Uh, uh, two, two, uh, uh, put them in, sell them in pairs, or make them in okay, pairs, okay. or what is it? Not, not, not on the same, not on the same stick. No. All right, now I got rid of that mistake. Now I like to embellish them a little bit. You can either put burn rings on it, um, and we'll do that. When you use burn rings, you want to put a little bit of a groove to track it with. Now you could just put those those grooves and leave it like that but because I brought a, a burning ring uh, and this is just a guitar string with a couple of uh, balls you want something you can grip not you don't want to put wrap around your hand or your finger it's a good way to lose a digit slow the speed down a little bit I, in this case it's in excess of 2200 there's nothing magic about the number but I find it, it needs to be somewhere at, north of 1500 and then instead of pressing down on it, this may be intuitive, obvious, intuitively obvious to the casual observer, but it wasn't obvious to me. I was turning to Bob Alday and he said, well, you need to drop your hand on the back so you get enough friction for it to burn fast. And it's like, duh. And you know, they're, they're, we're done, and you can make something similar. Now, when you go to buy these parts, uh, you can buy this six foot of this chain at uh, Home Depot at a very modest price. The problem is the little thing you put on the bottom. The top, you can get a, I think I got these at uh, Walmart. You can buy a box of the little couplers, and they come with different different colors. There's bright, there's nickel, there's shiny brass, there's antique, and maybe one of copper. Can you pass it around? Yeah. But the little, the little bell, uh, you can buy these in some Ace Hardware stores for about a dime. You can super glue them in there, but then you can't change it. And if you're selling them, it's nice to have that opportunity to change out. Somebody likes the pull, but they don't like the kind of, uh, chain you put on it then you're kind of these are fun little projects they're they're they make great gifts bear with me a second till I find my Here's some examples of variations of what I call a pillbox, and, it, and it's based on the idea of a needle case. I'll brace it right there. Now these are all somewhat similar. The needle case, it's longer and thinner. It's got a 3 8 inch. Now the thing that makes these things so easy is you hollow them out by drilling holes in them. So you need to get two holes. One is about an eighth of an inch bigger than the other, and then you turn the tenon to fit. Uh, I gave, I like this one. This is zebra wood, three-eighths inch hole. Uh, this is one I use and carry around in my pocket when I got to take pills in the in the evening, which as an old man I do, as a lot of us do. I gave one to to a friend of mine, and his pills wouldn't fit in it because they were too big. And that's when I, I realized that I've got to go to something. Uh, it can be almost as short, but it needs to go up one size drill hole. So I went from a 3 8 inch to a, to a half inch. So the, the lid uh, size is 5 8 inch. And that gives you 1 8 inch uh, to divide by 2 to give you a 16 inch wall. So that's what we're going to do. And I've got these made out of uh, Paduk. Rosewood, uh, Macassar ebony, uh, cherry, mystery wood. You know. Can you pass them around? Yeah, thank you. 
Jack kind of good for carrying uh, like goodies, uh, headache pills in the powder form? <laughs> Probably. Um, could be. You got a vacuum fit though, you maybe just have the powder. Nope. And like I say, one of them, one of them's got, uh, uh, it's got toothpicks in it, so somebody might might use it for toothpicks. So we're going to go back to this chart. Did you circulate your? Uh the part you were using the whole tool on the last one? Yeah. The wood, uh, yeah. One you just turned? What did I do with it? Where's the other one? The uh, mandrel. Yeah, right. Um, put in that one. Oh, right. Some of them don't use. Some of them will use. All right, who stole it? Uh, Oh, you want it back? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's it. Or one like it. <laughs> that's not the exact one, but I won't be using that one again tonight, so it'll work out fine. So we're going to crank this down pretty good. Now, there's other jaws that will do this job probably more effectively, but this seemed to work pretty well. If you've got 10 jaws that are a little longer, they'll do fine too. Who's got a question that I need to answer? Okay. Um, now, a roughing gouge will work fine to rough this down, but I tell you, a small, for something like this, a small bowl gouge will work fine as well. I swear I didn't I didn't change the direction on that. You know, and I think of roughing. Uh, you want to be as deliberate as you are cutting slices on on a banana for your for your cereal. You don't get points for style or creativity. You just want to get it done safely without cutting your finger. As most of you know, you can kind of tell when it's round by just putting this on the back and, and, and see if it bounces a little bit. But generally, you can hear it when it gets perfectly round because it'll go from a little tick sound to just a hit. Just about there. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to do the lid for this. And similar to the uh, lamp pull, we're going to scrape the bottom just to smooth it up. So I'm just going to run a scraper because this is end grain and the scraper does real well on end grain. Just make sure it's in a trailing mode position, that is, slanted slightly downward. Don't press real hard. Richard Raffin says you press down about as hard on a scraper as the pressure you'd put on your hands underneath an air dryer. Hand dryer. I thought that was kind of an interesting illustration. Now we're going to uh, drill the hole. So I go to my traveling toolkit of drill bits. I made this the other night. I thought this was kind of cool. Uh, and that's the three quarter. 
The easiest way to fail on this, this particular project is grab the wrong drill bit size. So I'm going to pull out the two I'm going to use, the 5 eighths and a half inch, and use the 5 eighths inch first. Thank you. I find that uh, for me, for using this size drill bit, it'll probably be fine to put it in here first. But I found that for, for these things, I can get them centered, especially with small drill bits like this, because you can see if it's centered. You put it on here, you can't always tell if you got it centered until you start drilling a hole and then you really wallow out a real mess. So I like to do this off the lathe. I have a 20 gauge bore brush, which is just kind of a nice tool to kind of keep the uh, Morse tapers clean because they, they will tend to fill up on you and you don't want it to go in there untrue. Now we're going to drill this thing about a half an inch deep, maybe a, sh a, a shade more. So I've already got it marked with a piece of tape and we're going to lower the speed down a little bit because we don't want to go too fast. Somewhere you know, probably south of a thousand. And we're going to be mindful of the smoke that comes off of it. When, when you see smoke, it's time to think about backing it out and clearing the chips. Otherwise, bad things can happen. You can either start a fire or on expensive, especially exotic woods, you got to generally clear it more often. And if you don't, sometimes it'll, it'll get embedded and you destroy your piece and you have to figure out how to get that drill bit out of there. Now when you extract this, always keep your hands on that uh, drill chuck because if it does get stuck and you retract this thing because you're not paying attention, bad things happen. I've heard. No, I, I can confirm that. Yeah. <laughs> Unlike a lot of folks, I, I'm generally pretty thoughtful about reading the manu carefully reading and understanding all the manufacturer's uh, uh, safety guidelines and from wearing safety glasses. But uh, so some of that stuff I've learned from other people's mistakes. And they say, oh, they say a, uh, a fool learns from his own mistakes, but a wise man learns from others. <laughs> all right, so now we've got this, uh, the bottom kind of finished. We'll worry about... Uh, uh, we're, gonna, we're not going to do a lot of sanding in here, but I'm going to hit it a lick so when we finish we'll have a usable box. I'm going to just kind of hit that face. And the walls are a little bit thick, and we'll worry about that later. So what we do now is transfer the inside diameter to the outside like you would any box. This is just basic box making. Uh, but it's simpler in that you don't have to rechuck this like you do because we're doing the, the lid on the outside. And normally for boxes, you don't normally do that. And I'm going to mark this about an extra eighth inch at the bottom to give ourselves a little bit of latitude. This depth uh, gauge came in a kit from Harbor Freight, like nine bucks, and you get these calipers and six inch ruler, and they're cheap. They're you know, they're not real well made, but they're good enough for me. And then we're going to part this off. When you part uh, something like this off, you want to back off and give yourself a little extra room, like one and a half uh, depths. Otherwise, it, it starts binding, and that tends to cause you problems. Now at this point in time, you, get, you make a decision on your design and say, do I want to embellish the outside a little bit? And I think, well, yeah, probably. So we'll turn this into a 60 degree cone. And we're not going to press it real hard to split it out, just enough to give it, to get, give it a little lateral stability as we uh, <coughs> tweak it a little bit.
Get the speed back up a little bit. And we're just gonna I'm gonna chamfer that edge just a little bit. Chamfer the back edge just a little bit, round it over. And then I think we're going to uh, put a bead on little small beads like this. I find a pyramid tool uh, or a point tool, a lot of people call it. It's got three sides. Works real well. You can make them uh, quarter inch high speed steel drill bits from uh, Inco, or you, this one actually came with Grizzly. I like this size better. It's 5 16ths. Uh, it's a scraper, so flat side up when you're using it. And it's already negative rake, which means if, if, if I hold it parallel, it's already going down. I don't have to worry about it, you know, getting sucked into the wood. Uh, no, that's fixed. It's got some epoxy. Now, if this was my shop, I'd have to have more task lighting to really be able to see uh, exactly what you're doing, be able to see the finish to see if like, you got any bad scrapes or uh, any finish details. I want to just crisp, crispen this up just a little bit on this one. Then we're going to hit it a lick with the uh, Sandpaper. This is Ron Brown's technique. He said, cut all the strips, staple them together, got them all together for little simple projects. He kept giving me the evil eye, afraid I was going to publish it or put it in a magazine article or something, I think. That's 220. This is 320. This is 400. Now we can finish parting it off. Now, if you're going to do any embellishing on this, now's the time to do it while it's got support. I could go in there and I could use a, a spiraling texturing tool. I could use burn rings, uh, but we're just going to make this pretty simple. And as you get near the very end, uh, turn loose the safety net. And I usually part off somewhere around 1,000, 1,200, rarely any faster than about 1,200. And that'll have a little nib we'll have to clean up.